Hi, I'm Bande Sujato and welcome to Dhamma Threads for another session discussing the suttas. And so this is a series where we're, we're coming together with a group of friends to talk about the meaning of the Buddha's teachings, especially discussing the Sama Dirti Sutta, the discourse on right view in the Majjhima Nikaya number 9. And we're using Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translation uh, for, um, uh, for reading purposes. And uh, we'll be, we've, so far we've been discussing this sutta from uh, uh, the opening of the sutta, talking about the, the wholesome and the unwholesome, the discussion of the different nutriments, the Four Noble Truths, and now there's a long sequence discussing the different factors of dependent origination. And uh, we've talked about our aging and death and birth, and we're now on to the factor of being, or bhava in Pali. So, as usual, let me uh, read through the uh, passage in the sutta and then we'll have some discussion. So, Venerable Sariputta uh, uh, has just finished talking about birth and then goes on. Uh, the, the bhikkhus say, Good friend. And the bhikkhus delight and rejoiced in the Venerable Sariputta's words and they asked him a further question. But, friend, might there be another way in which a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma? And the Sariputta replied, there might be friends. When friends, a noble disciple understands being, the origin of being, the cessation of being, and the way leading to the cessation of being, in that way he is one of right view who has arrived at this true Dhamma. And what is being, what is the origin of being, what is the cessation of being, and what is the way leading to the cessation of being? There are these three kinds of being. Sense sphere being, fine material being, and immaterial being. With the arising of clinging, there is the arising of being. With the cessation of clinging, there is the cessation of being. The way leading to the cessation of being is just this noble eightfold path. That is right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. When a noble disciple has thus understood being, the origin of being, the cessation of being, and the way leading to the cessation of being, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He extirpates the underlying tendency to the view and conceit I am. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. In that way, too, a noble disciple is one of right view, whose view is straight, who has perfect confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at this true Dhamma. Okay, so as usual, i uh, just like to uh, discuss the passage a little bit first. So this is talking obviously about a very uh, profound, a very fundamental topic, right? It doesn't get much more fundamental than that. What is being? Yeah. Now the Pali word that we're translating as being is bhava, and bhava is, uh, even though it doesn't sound much like the English word being, in fact is a, uh, uh, a etymologically a cognate of it. it comes from the same Indo-European root. Um, there are actually two roots in the Indo-European language to refer to be. One is, is bhu, which we have here as bhava, which comes into English as being and so on. And the other one is as, as in uh, asti or ati in Pali, uh, which in English we have as exists. So both of those roots survive. Um, uh, the connotation, of course, with such, a, with such a fundamental word, right? It's one of the most basic words you can possibly have in any language, right? So that the, it, it's used in a wide variety of cases and has a lot of different kinds of connotations in different different areas. Uh, so it's important to be very clear about how or how exactly we're using it in this particular sense. Now, uh, here Bhikkhu Bodhi has translated bhava as being. Okay. Now. Uh, in fact, when Bhikkhu Bodhi started translating uh, in, in his first translations, he translated Bhava as existence. He then moved on to use being here, and then later he went to use becoming. And then later on he went back to existence again. Right, so so that shows you a uh, even, even a, such a great translator uh, is not always certain or consistent in how he uses these things. Now the reason specifically why he used being in this translation uh, was because this was based on the translation originally by Venerable Nyanamoli. And Venerable Nyanamoli was, was an English monk who ordained in Sri Lanka after the war, 
after the Second World War. And uh, even though he lived for, he was only in robes for 10 years, he did a, an amazing amount of work. And he translated not only the entire Majjhima Nikaya, but also the entire Visuddhi Magga, uh, Patisambhita Magga, and a whole bunch of other stuff, all at an incredibly high quality. Uh, so he's left a lasting mark on Buddhist studies uh, uh, for the in you know in our times. Uh, and one of the aspects of Veramanyana Moli's philosophy was that he was he was very interested in this in this idea of being and existence. He was quite influenced by the um, by the European existentialist philosophers who were very uh, uh, predominant at the time, Sartre, Heidegger, and so on. Uh, and there are many long discussions between himself and other monks, especially another English monk called Venerable Nyanavira, precisely on this topic of being and existence and what exactly it means within the context of the Buddha's teachings. So because Nyanamoli had this very profound ph philosophical interest in this idea of being, and he thought that, that it should be translated as being, then uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi didn't want to change that. He felt that he had to keep the integrity of Nyanamoli's vision, uh, even though he changed other things, but in that particular case he thought that he should keep that as being. Now, in in various translations we find it rendered in different ways, and each way has kind of problems. We find it often rendered as becoming. Okay? And people say it's rendered as, be why do people remember it as becoming? Becoming is a very strange word. Right? We don't actually use it in, in English very much, right? But, but becoming is meant to give this um, implication that it's about change and growth, right? So it's, it's, coming, it's not actually a static thing, it's about coming into a different state. And the argument is that from a Buddhist point of view, that um, uh, uh, there's no such thing as a static essence of being, right? So we're not ever just are, ah, we're always growing, we're always changing, we're always becoming something else. And so that's the argument why it's supposed to be translated as becoming rather than being or existence. Yeah? Problem with that explanation is that that's precisely not what it means in the context of dependent origination and other places. Because the point is not, it's not presenting what is the Buddhist idea of becoming. It's presenting the idea of what we're trying to be escaping from. Right? Yeah? And so what, what, what bhava is here, and what, it, what, we're, what the bhava tanha is, the craving to be, right, is not the craving to keep on be, changing and becoming something else, right? It's not craving to become something else. Bhava tanha is the craving to be in some fixed eternal state. Uh, it's the craving to go to heaven or to be in some kind of state, to achieve some kind of happiness or whatever you whatever you want, right? whatever you conceive of as that state of perfection or whatever, to go and to be in that state. That's the problem. Yeah? Uh, and so uh, for that reason, I think that the translation as becoming is not really, uh, it kind of misses that point. Uh, then we can we can translate it as being or existence, but the problem with, the problem with translating it as being is being is not very, uh, being has a, has a, a number of um, sort of connotations and um, uh, implications in English which are not necessarily uh, adequate in, in the Pali context. For example, when we talk about puna bhava, right? Bhikkhu Bodhi, and again in this translation, rendered that as renewal of being. Yeah? And then he, he later on, and uh, in, in private communications, he expressed that, that he had sort of feedback that, that sounded like, you know, renewal of being meant that you had some kind of spiritual awakening or something like that. That's what it sounds like in English, right? It's a renewal of being means, oh, I'm a new man, you know, I've, I've, I've found new life, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've discovered God or I've discovered the Buddha or whatever I've done, I've renewed my being. Of course, that's not what it means. Right? So this, again, is a problem. The other problem is that bhava is a countable noun, right? Whereas not, neither being nor becoming is countable. Yeah, you can't have an, have in the in the in the um, in the Ratna Sutra talks about having an eighth being, an eighth bhava. Yeah, so the stream enterer does not have an eighth bhava. Nate bhavang atamangadianti. So you can't have an eighth being. Doesn't work. You can't have an eighth becoming. Neither of those are countable. So the only one that's left really is existence. Yeah. And existence is countable, right? You can have eight existences, 
and its uh, existence has a slightly more concrete kind of feeling to it. Uh, so I prefer to use the word existence, and these days Venerable Bodhi, I think, still uh, has gone back to using existence for bhava. Uh, now, what it actually means, so that's just a discussion of the terminology. What it actually means is quite interesting and quite subtle in, in Buddhism. The idea of a bhava in Buddhism is something like this. It's a bit hard to define exactly, but it's something like this. We are in this samsara. And in this samsara, we are constantly moving on and flowing and changing. That's what samsara means, right? Samsara is a, literally means flowing on. Yeah. From one moment to the next, we're different. From one hour to the next, we're different. From one day to the next, we're different. We're constantly changing, and there's no real stasis in that. Right? But there is a sort of a relative idea of stasis okay so we we do have periods where we're we're relatively somewhat similar right and so it's not it's not it's neither entirely continuous nor entirely discontinuous yeah so and so one of those and so so in this life for example uh we keep a human form right we, we change we grow all well, the human form actually changes but we have a similar name we have a similar personality there are there are things that connect in that life uh, where you can see that it's a relatively unified thing. Yeah? And so that's what we mean by a bhava. A bhava is an existence which is a, a relatively stable and relatively static period of time. Uh, and so then, of course, then you move on, maybe you get reborn in the animal realm or in the heaven realms or some different kind of realm where uh, it, it, it's almost entirely broken. There's very little connection from one to the other. Of course, it still is connected by karma and so on. But in terms of the obvious connection, then it's it's a radically different. So there's a period of relative stability and with little change, and then greater change with less stability. Yeah. So one one relatively stable period is regarded as one bhava, one existence. Yeah. In other words, what we call a life, and that that existence is um, is determined by the the karma which has given rise to that existence, and the uh, uh, the the crucial point about that existence is that the consciousness uh, is um, consciousness is is not determined but is is influenced or operates within a range which is made possible by that particular bhava. Okay, so think about for example, like if you're born say uh, as a mouse, for example, right? You have a certain range of possibilities of mousiness right and you can be a good mouse or a bad mouse right but you can't ever be a gorilla yeah or if you were a gorilla you'd probably be a fairly dysfunctional mouse yeah so uh, so there's a certain possibilities there but also certain limitations right? and so generally speaking in the animal world it's more highly constrained right animals are fairly narrowly fixed and most of the time you don't get geniuses and individuals and so on in the animal realm yeah most of the time not always uh, whereas in the human realm there's more flexibility right we see more variation within the human realm uh, but, but still is kind of bound to some extent it's bound by bio biology bound by culture bound by people's karma bound by all of these kinds of things which which limit and shut off certain possibilities and make certain other poss other things possible yeah and so that's within that one bhava, you have a certain set of possibilities and potentials that you can realize within that. Uh, similarly, in the uh, different other realms, invisible realms, heaven realms and so on, then they have certain things that are not possible and other things that become possible by being in that realm. Again, so this is the, the, the notion of a, of a bhava. Uh, and so we talked a little bit last time about this, the idea even of, of in-between states, what they call the antara bhava. Yeah? So according to... Uh, the, this is a kind of controversy within the Buddhist tradition, but according to some interpretations, there's like a period of time from one bhava to the next, right? So you, it's not just immediate sort of shifting, but there's a period of transition. Uh, and other, other uh, interpretations say that there's no period of transition. It's just one and then it's the next immediately. Uh, I won't go into it again, but, but last week we talked about that. And it, it seems to me that in the suttas, it usually uh, uh, talks in ways that suggest that there's a uh, a period of transition from one bhava to the next. So, for example, it will always give a simile, like, say, a, a man walking out of one house and walking down to a street and then walking into another house, right? 
rather than say a man walking from one room in the house to the next house, which would be you know a simile if there's no intermediate state. But there's always that sort of journey or that process from one state to the next. So, so we're in this bhava, and uh, these bhavas of, are of various kinds. Now, the the, the typical analysis of the bhava. Uh, in the, in this sutta is karma bhava rupa bhava arupa bhava so the threefold world world uh, and this idea of the three different kinds of worlds and so on is a very old idea in Indian cosmology uh, you find it back to the Vedic period uh, and it's conceived in 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 various ways um, I mean typically if we were to think about the threefold world we think of it in terms of uh, you know human realm and then heaven and hell right you said there's a lower realm we're in the middle and then there's above us and below us or something like that. Uh, but the way that the Buddha talked about it was we're in the lowest of the realms here, karma bhava, and then there's a rupa bhava, a rupa bhava. Of course, karma bhava itself being very complex and divided into many different kinds of aspects and levels. But the main um, uh, uh, unifying feature why it's a karma bhava is because it's driven by karma tanha, craving for senses. So we're craving to uh, experience sensual pleasures is the basic reason why beings get reborn in the karma bhava. Yeah? You want to see things, hear things, and so on. And then in the uh, rupa bhava, again, it's a bit difficult to, to translate this. It's not an idea which has uh, an exact correlate in English, right? But Bhikkhu Bodhi is translated here as fine material being, rupa bhava. In fact, what it basically means is um, uh, one of the jhana realms, okay? So you're born into a, be a state of being uh, because you've developed one of the four jhanas and then you get reborn into the Brahma realm which is associated with that. So uh, somebody at that level has let go of any kind of attachment to wanting to see, hear, smell, taste and touch, right? And they're just into pure radiant consciousness, yeah. And so they get reborn in that realm, and you basically get to become God for a while, yeah. So that's kind of cool, but of course, it's still impermanent. And then finally, is the most mysterious form of being altogether is the immaterial being, arupa bhava. So obviously, from developing the formless attainments, yeah. Not only do you let go of sense experience, but you also let go even of 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 any kind of physical embodiment or matter whatsoever. So that's a very kind of weird thing to try to imagine. What is the arupa bhava, right? You can't have any body, right? You don't have any senses, and you don't have any location, right? So you're kind of the whole universe and yet nothing at the same time, and you just stay there for tens of thousands of eons, right? Even when the universe ends, you just stay there. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, very, very, you know, one of these things that you sort of hard to get wrap your head around. Yeah, very hard to wrap your head around. But anyway, the main idea with these kinds of bhava is that the 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 objective state of rebirth is related to the uh, the, the 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 consciousness, or more specifically the karma, which has generated that state of rebirth. Okay. Now, in some of the Buddhist folk tales, it sort of depicts that in a narrative form in a very literal way, right? So that if you uh, give an offering and then make an aspiration to be reborn in such a he heaven realm or something, then at that very moment, this heavenly mansion, bing, appears for you, right? And it's all kind of ready and it just manifests out of nothing and you sort of can go in there and move in. There's no like council rates and you don't need to fix the plumbing and it's all terrific. It's all there. So that's a very kind of literal sort of way of representing that. But the idea is is that that as we develop our consciousness, right, we develop our consciousness at all kinds of levels. Now you think about it during the day, right? We all experience different kinds of consciousness. Yeah? Sometimes we're sleepy, sometimes we're awake, sometimes we're full of love, sometimes we're full of hate, sometimes our mind's peaceful, sometimes it's distracted, and all of these kinds of things. And those kinds of consciousness are associated with various kinds of karma, so various kinds of choices, right? So when our mind is in all of these different ways, we tend to make different kinds of choices. Right? And those choices are what powers the new bhava, right? They give energy to consciousness and they power and send our mind in a direction to get into reborn in some kind of new bhava. So uh, all of the different states of being in the Buddhist cosmology correspond to different states of consciousness, right? And 
Now, of course, you have all, I won't go into all the different states of being in the traditional cosmology and so on. You can look up a chart or something like that to look at all of those different ones. I would just sort of suggest that probably there's a lot more, right? I, I think that, I think that, that, you know, if you look at how variable the mind is, how many different kinds of karma there, how different people are, I think that the, that there's probably a lot of weirder and stranger ways of getting reborn than we've even imagined. This is my suspicion. Yeah. I mean, even in the Buddhist cosmology, as well as the standard heavens and hells, you also have kind of quirky things like the the, the, the rebirth in, in the, um, uh, what is it, the uh, Asanya Sata, right? So you get reborn without perception or without consciousness, right? So it's like the opposite of the immaterial realms, right? You just, you're only matter, yeah? So that's another kind of rebirth. No consciousness, just matter. Yeah? So there's all these kind of strange little quirky things in there. And I think that's, that's probably quite realistic. I think the reality is that existence is strange and quirky. You look in the animal realm, you look at how many unbelievable variety there is of different kinds of beings. And we're still discovering all of these kind of strange things. So uh, I don't think we should, you know, uh, to me, Bhava is as, as, as inexhaustible as the changes in consciousness. And uh, so the uh, practice of the Eightfold Path is the practice of letting go so that we're not identifying with any of these states of consciousness, we're not identifying with the Kama which is being produced from them, and then we're not identifying with the rebirth. One of the uh, great similes the Buddha taught about this was uh, the, in the Bhava Sutra, in the Anguttara 3, he said, Kamaṁ khetaṁ vinyanaṁ bijaṁ tanha sneho. Yeah, Kama is the field. Yeah? Consciousness is the seed. And craving is the moisture. Yeah? Very, very powerful imagery. Yeah? Kama is the field, right? So that's where you go to work, right? Kama meaning work. Yeah? So Kama is the action that you're doing in the field. Vinyana is the seed. And that, that's a that's very, very potent image. Right? You think about what is a seed. Yeah? Seed is something that's left over from the previous organism, which then leads to the new one. Right? And how does it do that? Well, it does that because it's got a code. Right? And the, the, the most important part of the seed that we understand these days is DNA. Right? And DNA, what's DNA? DNA is just a sequence of codes, right? And those codes carry the information for growing a new organism, right? So they don't do it by itself. It comes together with other conditions and so on, but it's the code which is the crucial part, yeah? Now that code, again, as we know from a modern information technology, you can, you can, you can express that code in any particular way. That doesn't matter, right? Uh, we, we, we have ours in DNA, which is actually a highly efficient and compact way of organizing information, but you can do it in any way, right? It's just, it's just as long as the information is there. But then that gives instructions for how a new life is to be produced. So vinyana bijang, yeah? The vinyana, the consciousness, has in, it has in it the code, yeah? The code, all the information that's necessary for giving rise to a new person a new being, a new animal, a new ant, right? whatever it is, a new elephant, and all of those things. And so what is that information? Well, that information is memories and karma and character t tendencies and all of those kinds of things. And that's all somehow inscribed in that. Uh, exactly what is the physical basis for that or, or how, how that relates in some way to a physical thing, if it does, is... I think a bit mysterious. Maybe we'll we'll find that out one day. Yeah, uh, but from the Buddha was looking at it from an internal perspective, from the perspective of the mind. And so, if we understand our own vinyana, then we understand what the possibilities for bhava or for existence are. When we look at this thing called uh, clinging or grasping. Personally, I don't really like the translation of clinging uh, because clinging means specifically refusing to let go of something that you already have, right? That's what clinging means, isn't it? Yeah, you're clingy, right? Because you're not going to let go, right? You've got something, you're going to hold on to it, you're not going to let go of it, yeah? Because this is not really what upadana means. Upadana means it's, it's an active force. 
it means going out and getting a new new bhava. Remember, grasping is the condition for bhava of a new life. So it's it's an active force. So yes, part of it would be refusing to let go of things, but it's also about getting more and having more. So I prefer the translation grasping rather than clinging. Yeah? Uh, for the same reason, I don't like the word attachment for upadana. Yeah? Grasping to me has a more active kind of sense. So uh, the literal meaning of the word, of course, is very close to that. It means grabbing hold of something. Yeah? Upadana is to grab hold of something. So uh, here we have the four kinds of upadana. Right? Grasping at sensual pleasures views, rules and observances, and a doctrine of self. I'll just talk about each one of these in turn, uh, just a little bit. So grasping at sensual pleasures uh, means going out and trying to get more, more um, uh, pleasant experiences through the senses. Uh, I'll come, come back to that in a minute, but I'll just leave that for now. Uh, the next one, grasping at views. Uh, Okay, so various kinds of ideas about uh, life, about who you are, and so on and so forth, uh, and what the, what the kind of the world is, what the nature of uh, purpose of life is, and so on. And so, uh, again, I'll come back to that in just a minute. I'll just briefly summarize what these ones are. The next one is rules and observances. So whereas views is your ideas and opinions about things, rules and observances is what you do. Okay, now this one they translate as, sorry, the Pali word is sila bata. Right? Sila meaning precepts, right? Okay? And bata meaning uh, vows, literally. Okay? So sila is precepts, but also is morality and behavior more generally. And bata meaning vows, okay? And observances. So that means what, what it's meaning specifically is like religious observances, like you say, you know, I'm going to fast every second Tuesday as a religious observance, or something like that would be an example of a kind of bata. And uh, of course, but I have my, you know, uh, you know, I have an alternative etymology for that. Have you heard my alternative etymology for this? Because sila, in Pali, as well as meaning ethics, right, and and precepts, also means rock. Like a rock is a sila, yeah. And vata, you know, you know, like sangsara vata is like the round of sangsara. So vata means to roll. So sila vata is rock and roll. <laughs> so this is means attachment to rock and roll. <laughs> So the Buddha was so far ahead of his time, right? <laughs> so, uh, so sila vata. Uh, again, I'll come back to that in a minute. But then the last one is the uh, atavada, is the uh, views of a self or doctrines of a self. Okay, now it's very similar to the views. Okay, in fact, atavada or views of self is really just the, the the the. It's actually the most important case of the kinds of views that you have is views about yourself. Um, but but specifically, this means having some idea that you know I am. Uh, I am an eternal soul that's going to live forever, or something like that. So you have this kind of view as atavada, upadana's attachment to that. Now that's just a general look at these uh, kinds of upadana, but of course each of them has uh, specific things which is worth just considering a little bit more, and I'll just make a few miscellaneous comments on that. With regards to the clinging to views, uh, one issue that you have in Buddhism is that a lot of people think that uh, and you find this quite commonly is that you shouldn't have any views, right? Because if you have a view about something, oh, you well, you know, you're very attached to your views, you know. And this is one of the most annoying, passive-aggressive Buddhist things that you can do, right? Oh, yes, well, you obviously have very strong views about that, right? And so you're then you're kind of dismissing somebody because they have strong views about it. There's one case where where somebody comes up to the Buddha and says, uh, "I have I have no liking for anything," yeah. And the Buddha's response is, well, this view that you have no liking for anything, do you have a liking for that? <laughs> right? So, of course, if you have the view that you shouldn't have any views, well, that's obviously a view, right? And that's a very powerful one. In fact, the human mind is based on the idea of views, right? We, we can't not operate according to views. And anybody who goes around and says, oh, you know, I don't have any views, is completely ignorant about how human psychology works, right? We've got views all the time, and we employ our views all the time, and we can't function without them, right? When you press the button to cross the lights, you have the view that the lights will change from red to green at a certain point in time, right? And you can't function without that kind of view and that kind of belief. And, and everything that you're doing at every point in your life 
when you turn the tap, you have the view that water is going to come out of the tap, right? You cannot function without having them. These are the things that give meaning and direction to your life. The point is that from a Buddhist point of view, that we can step back from our views and reflect on them as views, right? And we understand, well, this is just a theory. It's just an opinion. That doesn't mean that it's meaningless. It doesn't mean that I shouldn't have it. But it means that I'm able to reflect about it and to realize that some of my opinions are right, some of them are wrong, some of them are partly right and partly wrong, and that uh, uh, we can use our, our discussions with others, our personal experience, our reflection, our reasoning, and so on, in order to refine and correct and improve our views as we go along. Yeah? So this is what to, to not be attached to our views means. It doesn't mean that we go around and pretend that we don't have any views. Yeah? If you're pretending that you don't have any views, you're just in denial. And that's actually one of the deepest kinds of attachment to views that there is. Yeah? And I've seen people who've been like this, and they've been like this for decades, going along saying, oh, I'm not attached to views. And that view, that they're not attached to views, just remains unexamined. Yeah. Uh, rules, and, rules and observances... Uh, yeah, basically is the idea that you can find purification through commitment to some kind of external ob religious observance. Okay, Again, it's not to say that those obs external observances are wrong or that you shouldn't do them. It's just to say that you do them mindfully, you do them reflectively, you do them understanding what it is that you're doing rather than thinking that by sort of mouthing these words or by bowing in this way or by you know doing something like that, that that in itself will lead to some kind of purification. Uh, and so finally, the, the doctrine of self, Atavarupadana, now at its, in, in its kind of explicit form, right, it means that you have some kind of view about what your self is. Right? So, of course, in ancient India and in the Buddhist time, everybody had a view about the self, right? There's all Atmans and Jivas and all kinds of things, and there's all classifications of different views of self, and that was something that people were really into. These days... It's not such a kind of hot topic as such, is it? And, and, and people have a lot of kind of ideas about the self, but it's much more common for people to be very vague about it and to be very non-committal. Yeah? Uh, are you going to survive after death? Well, you know, I don't really know. You know? And, and a lot of people tend to be quite non-committal. So I think there's a lot more flexibility around that. And I think part of that comes from a sense of humility, a sense that, well, we've been through different stages and reflections and we realize that actually we don't know all that much um, if we look in psychology also psychology is sort of moving towards handling the idea of self in a much more reflective and dynamic and shifting way rather than being some fixed essence yeah uh, and in way that in fact that's much more similar to how buddhism approaches the idea of a self so on the one level you have those those um explicit doctrines of self but underneath that of course then there's there's the underlying tendencies which to frame things in terms of a self yeah uh, now uh, uh, at this level in this 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 stage is only talking on that more explicit level of talking about actual theories of the self right self re re reflective when you think to yourself about what yourself is and so on the underlying tendencies are something which is more subtle and that's, that's not what's meant by this Atavarupadana. Yeah, that's, that's got a further phase of development. Yeah.